Back in my final year at MSU, I was invited to take part in a research expedition to the Hanya wetlands in northern Sweden. It was part of an exchange through the AWC, Arctic Wellness Cooperative, funded by members of the Arctic Council and private actors in the area. Me and Roger, Raj Dawson, took a flight in early May. During the 55-minute layover at Arlanda, Stockholm, we met up with Helene Angermark from the Royal Institute of Technology. When we arrived at the Umia airport, we met up with the last member of our expedition, Camilla Ostermo from Lulia University. From there, it was just a long drive north. The Hanya wetlands are enormous. We're talking about 700,000 acres of mire and wetland just above the Arctic Circle. In optimal conditions, and excluding factors such as sleep, food, terrain, weather, it'd take about 11 days to walk across. In my head, it conjured up images of the dead marshes from Lord of the Rings, but Helene assured me it was nothing quite as dramatic. Raj and I had no idea what to expect. We'd gotten our equipment pre-purchased. The Swedes were in charge of everything practical on site, excluding our personal equipment. We were scheduled to spend four days in the actual mire, and four more days accounted for travel. And sure, we had wildlife and camping experience, but you can't prepare for something like the Arctic mires. May is a strange time in northern Sweden. While technically spring, it can still dip in sub-zero temperatures, Celsius. The weather can range from blazing heat in the afternoon to frost in the early morning. So while we had a variety of clothes, we still had to be flexible enough to change throughout the day. There's no one thing fits all up there. The further north we drove, the more things started to look the same. Long stretches of road through the wilderness that seemed to go nowhere. Nothing but moss, undergrowth, and sprinkles of spindly trees. I was chewing on my last Slim Jim when Helene brought up her laptop. So we have eight designated sites where we need to do some sampling, she said. But Camilla and I have been talking, and we think we ought to be able to get one further in. We have to go a bit off-road to get some reliable results. When did you talk about this? I asked. Gotta read the group chat, said Raj. I told you to get in on that. I'm in, I'm just not getting notifications. Then you're not in. I'm telling you, I'm in. Either way, said Helene, if we take a detour north after Site 3... We ought to get some reliable samples before we reach four. It should work with your schedule. You're the locals, you got this, said Raj. I leave this to your judgment. We're not locals, said Camilla. I'm from Lulia, that's like a four-hour drive. Stockholm is like a twelve-hour drive from there. So we're going in blind? I asked. None of you have been there before? That's kind of the point, to get acquainted with it said Camilla, to get something for the next group to compare when they do another expedition in five or so years. All about long-term cooperation, smiled Helene, like it says on the website. Raj leaned over and patted me on the shoulder, holding up his phone. I just checked, and you're not in the group chat. We were stuck in the car all day. We reviewed our notes, plans, equipment, and route. Much of what spurred the expedition to begin were reports of wildlife changes. The indigenous Sami people had moved their reindeer herds north, claiming that the animals were getting sick from the soil. There had also been reports of reduced fish population and increased bird migration in the southwest. We were there to measure possible toxins and soil changes to, if possible, determine a cause. But first we needed samples, which was the meat of the expedition. There started to pop up little villages along the forest road. Well, maybe not villages, more like loose collections of houses within view of one another. Red houses with white corners and metal roofing. How anyone could live that isolated was beyond me. Still had great phone coverage, though, somehow. We passed through a town with a name I won't even begin to pronounce or spell. Too many vowels. It was our last stop before we got to the wetlands, so we made sure to stock up. Camilla got us some extra batteries. When we finally arrived, it was dark. We'd been following a gravel road for the past 40 minutes. There were six houses in a semicircle along the road, one of which we'd rented for the night. The rest were abandoned. 
Camilla dragged her stuff in and collapsed on the living room couch. Helene took the downstairs guest room. There was a second bedroom upstairs with three smaller beds for me and Raj to occupy. I was asleep the moment my head hit the pillow. The following early morning, it was all hands on deck. Helene was preparing sandwiches in the kitchen while Camilla checked our equipment. All batteries charged, all containers properly marked and sorted. She was meticulous, and at 5.30 a.m. we were ready to go. I took a moment to soak up the atmosphere. The smells felt alien yet familiar. The air was buzzing with insects, and I could hear nesting birds in every direction. Despite the four of us being the only people in the area for miles and miles, it felt very much alive. It was a vast forest with a canopy and with the waking sun gazing down on us from an endless sky. Helene took the lead with Raj following suit. Then there was Camilla and finally me. There were paths marked with orange flags showing us the intended way. Anyone know any good songs? asked Helene. Uh, you could teach us some, said Raj. Preferably something we can pronounce. As long as we make noise, said Camilla. It keeps the bears away. We began our rendition of Sma Grodona as we began trudging along the path, going deeper into the wetlands. Minutes later, it was clear to me there'd be no way to navigate the mire without those little flags. Everything looked the same. The same trees, the same bushes, the same moss and no clear paths to follow. We weaved and bobbed through the mire. We all wore these tall rubber boots and pants, along with backpacks that only reached halfway across our backs. There'd be spots where we'd have to wade through water that would reach over our knees, so we had to keep as dry as possible. It was a pain to walk through, and I could feel a rash growing on my thigh within the first 15 minutes of walking. We reached our first site at 7 a.m., Camilla brought out the testing equipment. She and Raj took turns calling out what kinds of samples they were getting while Helene recorded it all on her laptop. I cataloged and stored everything. It took us about 30 minutes all in all. As we packed up to move to the second site, Camilla pointed out something in the undergrowth. Lots of animals here, she said. Look. She pointed at the ground, but I saw nothing. I shrugged. How do you say it? Hjortan? Helene, what's, what's that in... Cloudberry. Right. There should be cloudberries here. See the petals? What the hell is a cloudberry? Chuckled Raj. Never heard of it. Makes great jam, added Helene. Maybe we'll see some further along, said Camilla, where there's less animals. It took us another four hours to get to the second site. We spun around in circles for a while and had to get the sat-nav to find our way back. Standing out there with water up to my knees, looking for those orange flags. It was scary. Camilla seemed confident, though. At worst, we'll just go straight southwest, she said. As long as we can see the sun, we can navigate. Sure enough. When we got to the second site, there was a stretch of dry ground where we could rest. We stopped for lunch. Helene set up a portable stove to make us some coffee while Camilla and Raj got some samples. Soil, water, vegetation, all kinds. Still nothing, said Camilla, poking around the moss with her feet. No Hyartron. Cloudberries, Raj added. Right, cloudberries, all gone. Is that strange? I asked. Sort of. Reindeer usually don't go out this far. We finished up and moved to Site 3. We were finished just after dinner time. We had a few more hours until sunset, so we decided to move north. Camilla and Helene had mapped out a place where we could get some more reliable samples, and it'd be just a few hours off the trail. There'd be plenty of dry land to set up camp as well, so it didn't mess with our schedule too much. When we stepped off the trail and left the orange flags behind, I got this itch along my spine, like I was stepping into something out of my control. Those little flags were the only trace of civilization left. Without them, we were in the deep wilds. And still, no cloudberries. We set up camp around 8 p.m. The sun was getting low, but we had plenty of flashlights with us. We changed our clothes, set up our tents, and crawled into our sleeping bags. Camilla read an article on erosion, and Helene uploaded her best images to Instagram. 
even now, we still had great cell phone coverage. Raj was taking notes and double-checking our batteries. I twisted and turned back and forth for hours, but I just couldn't get any shut-eye. My eyes kept popping back up. Long after the others were asleep, I was still up. It was useless to keep trying, so I decided to walk it off. I stepped out of the tent and wandered around for a while. The horizon was blood-red, and the sparse trees cast long, gangly shadows across the camp. A thought hit me. We'd forgotten to set up the mosquito lights. This place ought to be flooded with mosquitoes, but there was nothing. It was all quiet. Not a bird, not an insect, nothing. Just creaking branches carefully swaying in the wind. Compared to what we'd felt when we first stepped into the mire, this was... dead. It was almost midnight when I saw something in the distance. There was this long stretch of ankle-deep moss water next to our campsite. I looked out across it for at least ten minutes before I realized that one of the trees was not a tree. It was a reindeer. The thing had been standing perfectly still, not even moving its head. I'd mistaken its antlers for branches. I sat there looking at it for at least half an hour, and in all that time it didn't move a muscle. Not a twitch of the neck, nothing. Never seen anything like it. Eventually, I got back in my tent. I barely got any sleep. The reindeer was gone by morning. I told Camilla about it, and she insisted that they were skittish creatures. They'd stay away from us. Maybe it was just curious. We got the extra samples early in the morning and started to move east towards our main route. By then, we all had soggy feet and a sour mood. Camilla and Raj had a long and intense discussion about preservation efforts and EU regulations, while Helene kept stopping to take pictures for her Instagram. At around 9am, we all heard something in the distance. The discussion died down as we all tilted our heads and listened. At first I thought it was a wounded animal. There was this rising and falling squeal like a big bird call. It took us a few seconds to realize that it was a person. A monotone scream over and over. The exact same pitch and tone. This desperate, heart-wrenching death scream. Help, said Helene. Someone's calling for help. We circled back and tried to locate the sound, but it just seemed to get fainter and fainter, as if whoever called for us moved further away. We tried yelling back, but they didn't seem to get any closer. After about half an hour, we couldn't hear them anymore. Raj was visibly shaken, his cheeks flushed and eyes watery. We were all a bit uneasy about it. Camilla tried to make sense of it, saying it might have been an animal, but we couldn't figure out which one. Still, it had to be an animal. It had to be. As we made our way to Site 4, we shared our thoughts. There were a lot of things out there that didn't add up. No birds, no insects, no animal droppings or markings. It felt off. We found our way back to the main route with the orange flags. Following them, we spotted something that would come to haunt us forever. On the path ahead was this large, overarching tree, much larger than others in the area. And from the tree hung no less than four reindeer carcasses. They were seemingly placed there, the antlers tangled into the branches. Dry and tattered flesh dangled like sick fruit hooves gently tapping against one another in the mild breeze like a nightmare wind chime. Helene put away her phone and Camilla stared, slack-jawed. Raj looked at me for reassurance, but I had none to give. Camilla tried to say something, but lost the words along the way. Composing herself, she gave it one last try. Sometimes the, uh, the bears, they hide their prey. This isn't... This isn't hiding, said Raj. This is full display. I don't know what to tell you. We looked around, spotting strange markings on the bark. Mostly hoof marks, but also something else. We were all shaken after seeing it. It haunted me. I could almost imagine hearing the dead hooves if I stopped to listen. Helene had gotten her phone back out and didn't look up from it. We got to Site 4 at 1pm. Same procedure as always. Camilla and Raj took the samples, Helene took notes, and I catalogued and stored it. We had a late lunch, but couldn't find anywhere to set up the kitchen to make coffee. 
We were going into the deeper mire. The dry land was getting sparse. Following the orange flags, we had to stop several times to navigate. We were coming up on what should be a large lake, but there was nothing there. A slope into more moss with no trees. If anything, it looked like the water had been drained. Helene took some pictures, but Camilla was convinced we were off track. There was no way a lake would disappear on its own. We had to be going the wrong way, no matter what the satnav was telling us. Still, we followed the flags. And just past 2 p.m., we got to this enormous open space where the trees spread out. We could see for miles ahead. And somewhere out there, we heard it. Again, someone calling for help. The same monotone scream, the same pitch. This time, we didn't call back. Instead, we just stood there, listening. We identified at least two sources, one to the northeast, one to our west. The screams were coming from two completely different directions. It has to be a bird, said Camilla. A mating call or uh, That's not a fucking bird, whispered Helene. That's a person. What's more likely, Helene? asked Camilla. That a pair of identical twins are following us and calling out to us, or that we're hearing the echoes of a nesting bird? I don't think anyone here is an ornithologist, said Raj. So we can't tell for sure. But yeah, I don't think that's a person. It's saying help. Birds can't pronounce L or P. Say what you want, but that's something else. We went through Site 5 and stopped for the night halfway to Site 6. I was getting nervous. I kept imagining that repeated call for help out in the mire. I thought I saw antlers among the dead trees a few times. I was getting paranoid. Site 6 was our furthest point before we started to circle back. But this was dangerous territory. One sprained ankle could mean aborting this whole expedition. The orange flags had stopped some time ago. They didn't reach across our whole route. We were on our own from this point forward. Camilla was confident, though, and with only three more sites to go, we were ahead of schedule. There was barely enough dry land for us to set up our tents, but we made it work. The ground was moist, and I had a puddle of something cold next to my feet. It was uncomfortable, to say the least. I collapsed into an uneasy but welcome sleep. Raj gently shook me awake sometime in the middle of the night. He held a finger to his lips and motioned his hand to his ear, as if telling me to listen. There was that scream again, and it was much closer. I dressed myself and got out of the tent. Camilla and Helene were already up. We all huddled together at the edge of our camp, looking out across the mire. It was too dark to see, but the screamer couldn't be far off. Camilla held up her flashlight and gave us a nod. We nodded back. We had to see what this thing was. She turned on the flashlight. There were a dozen reindeer about 60 feet ahead of us, all standing at the exact same angle looking directly at us. No one blinking, moving, or recoiling from the light. We all froze, not wanting to make any sudden movements. These were supposed to be timid woodland creatures, but something was off. One of them slightly opened its mouth, stared at us, and called out in a perfectly human, Help. Helene covered her mouth, holding back a scream. The reindeer, one by one, called out to us, all with the same mechanical movements and identical voice. Help. It was fucking eerie. Raj decided enough was enough and got up. He tried to make himself big, stretching out his arms and waving them up and down. He huffed and yelled, trying to scare them off. They didn't react in the slightest. That is, until the reindeer at the very front turned its head to look directly at him. It slowly raised its front legs and leaned backwards. In a matter of seconds, it was standing upright like a human. The others coalesced around it, circling like a school of sharks, all while screaming out over and over, calling for help. Don't... don't provoke it, whispered Camilla. They're... they're sick. They look sick. We should go, said Helene, right now. No one argued. Camilla stood guard while the rest of us packed up as quickly as possible, 
all to the sound of constant screams for help. We were sloppy, but considering the panic I had building in my chest, it was a miracle we got anything at all. Raj and I were halfway through stuffing the tent in its bag when we heard something. Movement in the woods and another scream for help. This time from the west. Raj got another flashlight and checked it out. As he turned it on, I could see a dozen more eyes looking back at us. They were much, much closer. They're everywhere, gasped Raj. They're everywhere. It's a herd, said Helene. The Sammy, they used to move herds through. She was interrupted by another scream. This one by a reindeer right next to us, within arm's reach of Camilla. But the scream was lower, drawn out, and much clearer. The upright reindeer in the middle of the mire was still standing there, staring at us. As the scream died down, we all held our breaths. No one wanted to move. No one wanted to act. It all hung on a threadbare balance, and anything could tip the scales. Then, chaos. Hooves came trampling through camp, these massive, 300-pound creatures running completely wild, knocking into one another, crashing through bushes, running headfirst into the trees, stumbling over rocks and roots. They were like frenzied sharks smelling blood in the air. One of the reindeer reared up and bore down on Camilla over and over again. I could hear her chest snap as all air was pressed out from her lungs. Her flashlight tumbled from her hands, rolled into the mossy water, and was swallowed by the dark. Raj took off running, but didn't get far. One of them bit into his arm as he tried to get past, sending him reeling into the ground. From there, they had no trouble pounding him into a pulp, heavy hooves breaking bones like they were dry pasta. It was absolutely dreadfully morbid. I crawled on all fours, trying to keep out of sight. There were so many of them, but they only seemed to attack what was directly ahead of them. Still, one might stumble over me and decide to kill me. But I was running out of options. I kept to the ground and moved slowly, my hands sinking into the inch-deep moss, the ice-cold water floating to the surface. My veins ached. There was screaming all around me, and somewhere in the torrent of whales, both Raj and Camilla had gone silent. One of them almost tripped over me, giving me a mild kick to the chest. I say mild only because it didn't kill me, but I'm pretty sure it bruised a couple of ribs. Another stepped on my thigh, ripping open a two-inch long cut along the side. Still, little by little, I made it out. I kept going forward, no matter the sound, no matter the pain, I kept going. As the sun rose, I couldn't hear them anymore. I'd collapsed in the moss, panting like I'd run a marathon. There were no songbirds, no insects, nothing. Just me, the sun, and the mire. I used the elastic band for my underwear to make a makeshift bandage using dry moss from a tree to soak up the blood. It wasn't a deep cut, but it could easily get infected. I could still stand, but I felt the sting of pain in my chest with every breath I took. I could see a deep bruise forming, going straight from blue to reddish purple. I was lost. I was in the middle of nowhere with little to no equipment. I've never been so freaked out in my entire life. I screamed and cried, I, I don't know for how long. One moment I wanted to lie down and just wait for someone to find me. The next moment I wanted to run blindly straight ahead. After a while, I composed myself. I thought about what I'd learned about the area and what I'd seen. I knew there were flags put up along safe routes. I could also use the sun to navigate. If I went straight southwest, I should stumble upon the flags again. From there, I'd just have to follow them. I'd either pop back out where we started or on the other side of the wetlands. Still, either way, would be a long walk, and there were no guarantees that I'd make it. But I had to try. I tried not to think, not to reflect. I, I focused on the road ahead and the position of the sun. Everything else was secondary. But every flash of what happened that night felt like a cut in my stomach. The way Camilla's flashlight disappeared, Roger's scream with that first bite, the only one I couldn't account for was Helene. I hoped against hope that she got out. That she had the same idea as me. Maybe I'd meet her down the line. If not, I could tell the police there was at least one person unaccounted for. They'd have to send a rescue party. I must have walked for hours. 
It is surreal to walk in a space where all you hear is yourself. There's usually some sort of external sound. A car passing by, a squawking bird, a humming motor. Something, somewhere off in the distance. Out there, there was nothing. Just the ever-present crackling sound of dry branches snapping under my heels as I limped forward, step by step. I lost all concept of time and swayed back and forth between single-minded purpose and scatterbrained despair. But in a moment of clarity, I stopped to listen. The screams again. They were ahead of me, so they weren't following. They were merely in the area. I flinched as I saw branches move in the wind. My reptile brain thought they were antlers. I hunkered down and listened. Helene. This scream wasn't like the others. It wasn't the same sound over and over. They were different and irregular. She wasn't screaming for help, but in pain. She was alive. Now I had two choices. I could try and keep moving until I found the flags and just hope to get out somehow. Or I could try to find Helene and her things. She had the sat-nav last time I checked. It was a battle between my instincts and my reasoning. I'd be putting myself in danger either way. But if I could help her in any way, I had to try. At the very least, I could try to fetch some supplies. I followed Helene screaming. She was heading straight north, deeper into the mire. She was on the move, slowly but surely. I measured the distance. After a while, she stopped screaming. I figured she'd passed out. It took me about an hour of searching before I found something. There was a young tree that had been stripped of leaves and covered in blood like someone had grabbed the bottom of it and dragged their hand along it. There were clear red stains across the leaves. There was no trail to follow, but I could hear something moving to the north. Maybe more reindeer, maybe Helene. The ground started to get muddy. There were algae and reeds drying in the sun. I could hear screaming in the distance. Not just Helene. Not like a person. Just those creatures. Pretending to be people. But there were more of them now. So many more. I could hear dozens of them screaming back and forth. Screaming for help. I pushed on. I had to see. To know. There was something up ahead and I needed answers. There was a small hill. And after that, a sudden drop. I crouched at the edge, looking down. There was this... dried-out lake with a deep crack in the ground going down the middle, revealing parts of a dark underground cave through the mud and debris. I could smell the moss drying in the sun. It must have been midday by then, and the sun was casting harsh shadows across the mire. There were hundreds of reindeer. Hundreds. Some standing up, others shuffling along on all fours. All moving in a circle around the crack in the ground where something massive moved. Some of the reindeer were dragging things along. Pieces of flesh, dead birds and fish. I could have sworn one of them was dragging parts of Camilla's tent. They were neatly lined up and took turns dumping whatever prize they had into the crevasse. Those who had nothing to contribute stayed on the sidelines eating. Everything looked so different in this light. I could have sworn most of the moss and flowers they ate looked strangely blue. And there, among the debris, was Helene. Her unconscious body was being unceremoniously dragged through the mud and dumped in front of the crevice. I could see her head moving, struggling to regain consciousness. I could see her mouth moving, but there was no way to hear her over the wailing screams of the creatures. But for just a short moment, I could have sworn she saw me. Just a moment of recognition. Then, without a sound, something emerged from the crevasse. A long, bone-white hand, large enough to wrap its fingers around her chest, carefully dragging her into the dark. For a moment, the reindeer got quiet. An awful crunch echoed through the makeshift clearing. And seconds later, the reindeer made a new sound. This time, in Helene's voice. A tired, barely conscious voice. Come down, it said. Help me. Those four words were repeated over and over by all of them. In her voice. 
in all constellations and combinations. Come help. Help come. Down, help. Help down. The horrid screams replaced by a dying whisper. A whisper intended for me. I was too afraid to move. I stayed there looking down. Every now and then that large bone-white arm would emerge. Sometimes to put away something inedible, sometimes to grab hold of a reindeer to drag into the deep. At one point a white finger touched the forehead of a reindeer, making it stand up on its hind legs like a humanoid. Those who stood up seemed to be of great importance as the others encircled them. But there was no one to save. There was nothing left for me to gather. All that was left was for me to leave and never look back. I kept going south. Every now and then I'd hear them, a whisper of, Come help me, finding its way through the sparse vegetation. Come. Come help. Help me. These things were everywhere. And they were looking for me. Reindeer have a great sense of smell, so I took a short dip in stale lake water to hide my smell. My leg would definitely get infected. I limped my way through the undergrowth, stopping only to listen for clues on what paths to avoid. By nightfall, I still hadn't found any flags. My leg was in such a burning pain that I couldn't lean on it anymore, and my muscles ached. I was constantly out of breath, not wanting to draw too much air into my lungs. But I had to keep going. There was a good chance that I'd die out there if I had to spend the night in the open. Temperatures could easily dip into freezing. Once the blood-red sunset started to gleam in the distance, I knew I was short on time. My hands were shaking and I could barely stand, I could barely move. Everything in me wanted to just sit down and hope for everything to be okay in the morning. It was so easy to trick myself into doing so, but I just kept going. I stopped. There was something up ahead. I caught a glimpse of eyes reflecting the setting sun. For a moment they locked onto me. And a second later it burst into a sprint. I thought I was done for. I had no fight left in me. I turned to run, but only made it a few steps before I tripped. Then a gunshot. The reindeer collapsed next to me, those big black eyes meeting mine. It struggled to breathe. Help. Help me. It whispered in Helene's voice. Come down. Come help me, come. It didn't understand what it was saying. It was just noise. But there was something there, and as that reindeer opened its mouth to speak again, I caught a glimpse of it. Something thin and bone-white lingering far down its throat. Something vaguely humanoid. A second pair of eyes looking up. Then, another gunshot. I was blinded by a flashlight. There were these three men all speaking Swedish, all dressed in some kind of logging company jackets with trucker caps. They all had these yellow reflective vests on them. I told them I didn't understand, and they changed to heavily accented English. British? American? One of them asked. American, I said. We... there was a... I... Attack, yes. They attack. He nodded. We know, we know. Come. The three men dragged the reindeer away, tied a rope around its antlers, and made a great effort to hoist it up to a nearby tree, just like the tree I'd seen with the others just days prior. Keep some here, said a man who'd helped me. Mix a... Uh, grands. Border? Like a... Like a warning, I added. Yes, like a warning, he nodded. They understand. He looked up at the dead body hanging from the tree. They smarter here. No more. I was taken back to their base camp. About eight people living in caravans. They gave me fresh clothes, hot dogs, beer, and warmed me up by the fire. They disinfected my thigh and stitched me up while I tried to sleep off my upcoming fever. They called the police and the embassy in Stockholm. And the next day I was back on a plane to the States. Like nothing ever happened. The aftermath has been pretty much nothing. It was classified as an animal attack and dismissed. I talked to a few people from the AWC about it and they called it a sincerely regretful incident. 
and asked me to remain discreet as to not discourage future climate change studies. The AWC still operates in that area, by the way. I've got no answers as to what they've done with the soil samples or if they ever looked into what I saw in the mire. All I know is that no one wants to talk to me about it. The only people I've gotten answers from were the hunters. They were eager to share their stories, claiming that the government refuses to listen. I'm still in email contact with some of them, and there's a lot to unpack. But in short, there was a quake in the mire. Something came out of the lake. It did something to the wildlife in the area. It stole hundreds of reindeer from local Sami herds. It seems to be expanding. Stopping only where it finds immediate and violent resistance. And over time, it seems to learn. This was some time ago, and I don't feel comfortable revealing the entire timeline. I don't want to give anyone more reason to silence me. But I know this is bound to happen again. Something similar happened in West Virginia back in 2013. A lake drained in Greenbrier Valley, and then all hell broke loose. It's only a matter of time before it happens somewhere more public. And when it does... Remember, it seems to learn. Today's bonus story is brought to you by Campfire Tales. If you haven't checked out Campfire Tales' channel, Zach is an amazing narrator with a ton of videos over there. So I hope you guys will listen to this next story and check out his channel if you enjoy his work. This next story was written by Random Appalachian 468 It's titled... I'm an oil field worker in Barron County, Ohio. We're under attack. Please enjoy. They'll never tell you about the war. It'll never appear on the news or in the history books. No countries will petition our case in the UN. We'll never get any aid supplies or vast shipments of weaponry from the government. I doubt the internet will even notice my little post. But I figure it's worth a shot. At least someone out there might find it and try to do something, even if that something is coming down to pick up all the bones once it's over. I suppose by then you won't be able to recognize any of this. That's okay. Just dump us in a pit together and make sure someone other than the government gets to inherit our stuff. I'm not trying to be tough or melodramatic, just honest. My name is Ethan Sanderson. Right now, I'm sitting around the fire with the others, shoveling down a bowl of unsweetened oatmeal and typing this while I have time. To think my world was sane only a few hours ago. Everything normal obliterated in just over 60 awful minutes. There's no way I'll ever get back to my old job. Not with the roadblocks during the day and the attacks at night. Nope. I'm here to stay. And so I figure I may as well share my story while this bout of decent cell service lasts. It all started when I was driving home from another round of the night shift at the Brighton Smith Petroleum Refinery, tired, covered in grease, and ready for a hot meal before bed. The radio crackled, auto skimming through various channels, looking for anything other than twangy country music, self-pitying pop songs, or yet another news report yammering on about how close we were getting to nuclear war with the Russians. My truck's engine rumbled with a comforting, quiet regularity, and I let myself smile in pride at that. One thing I can do, and that's getting an engine running smooth as silk. As an only child, with my father dying from lung cancer when I was 15, and my mother hooked on drugs since I was 12. I had been on my own for most of my life. Engines had been the one thing I excelled at, school being my nemesis. And after I had fixed up an old F-150 bound for the scrapyard, 
I had took the first oil rig job I could find and left town. I had done well for myself, staying away from the dealers that had wrecked my mom's life, and accumulated enough money to buy a camper, several firearms, and a little solar power setup that allowed me to travel all over the country and relative comfort. Despite never having gone to college, I considered myself successful, and if I ever found a woman who didn't mind the grease on my overalls and wasn't a total lunatic, maybe I'd settle down and have kids of my own. Whatever the case, I swore to myself I'd be a better parent than either of mine had been. No cigarettes, no meth, and no throwing chairs when I got angry. My thoughts were shattered at the sight of several white and orange plastic barricades stretched across the cracked asphalt, completely blocking my path. Behind them, two massive slate-gray trucks were parked nose-to-nose -nose across the roadway, just in case someone did get the bright idea of pushing past the flimsy obstructions. Five men dressed in similar gray uniforms and carrying shiny black rifles stood at the roadblock, with two more perched in the turrets of the armored trucks, manning belt-fed machine guns. I hadn't seen any signs of warning of construction, and never a road crew with armored vehicles, which made something sour twist in the pit of my stomach. As a ghetto kid from Pittsburgh, I'd learned to know that I was in a bad area and this was all kinds of bad. Look at Barron County trying to be Chicago. I grunted to myself and slowed to a stop in front of the barricades, waiting for the nearest soldier to walk up to my driver's side window. He approached, rifle at low ready, and I noted the automatic switch on its receiver. Nope, these guys weren't regular civilians out for the LARP. You need serious cash to have that kind of firepower, which meant I had to be dealing with some branch of our murky federal government. Just stay calm. You've got nothing to hide, and you've done nothing wrong. Play it cool. Hey, man. I put on a friendly smile, scratching at my beard and pointing at the roadblock. Is there uh, some kind of accident up ahead? Train derailment. From behind his dark face mask, the soldier casually threw out what must have been a predetermined lie, because I knew there was no railroad line near this stretch of the road. A real bad one, I'm afraid. We've been tasked to keep all the civilians out of the area until it's all clear. Which way you headed? He seemed friendly enough, confident and relaxed though I noted the beginnings of a tattoo that poked from under his uniform sleeve. Rangers lead the way. Something prickled in the back of my mind, a low warning that had saved me from many a muggings in my younger days. These guys weren't local. They didn't have any identifying patches or marks on their vehicles. And with how nice this gear looked, they weren't here as part of some hazmat team. Besides, if they were so hell-bent on keeping people out, then why was one of the machine gunners facing the road behind them, as if waiting for someone to try and escape their ring of steel? Collingswood, I rested my elbow on the truck window and jerked a thumb back towards the way I'd come. I work at the oil refinery up the road. You guys military? The soldier chuckled and shrugged. Once upon a time, my dude. We're with the cleanup teams providing security. Like I said, there's some bad stuff down this road. Don't want people tracking through it and getting sick. Interesting timing. I hadn't even heard about any accident. And yet there's already a cordon? Never saw the government move so fast. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. I played along and eyed the rest of them for any symbols that might tell me just who I was dealing with. Well, I'll be honest, this is normally the road I take home, and it's going to take me way out of my way to go around. You sure I couldn't just... From behind his mask, 
The man gave out a sympathetic sigh. Sorry, man. I've got my orders. No one passes unless they're official personnel. But hey, it should be all clear like in a few days tops. Putting my truck into reverse, I stuck out my hand, doing my best to put them all at ease, and keep the rifles pointed away from my head. Well, hey, thanks for letting me know. I'll tell the other guys at the rig, and we'll try to keep out of your hair. I appreciate it. Despite the mask over his face, I could see the ends of his grin as the soldier shook my hand, and the others relaxed, their guns staying pointed at the ground. Like I said, we'll be done in a few days at most, so if anyone starts getting riled, just let them know we've got this. Uh-huh. Sure you do. I eased backwards into a U-turn and drove until I was well out of sight of the roadblock. As soon as they left my rearview mirror, I killed the lights and drifted into the grassy berm, coming to a stop with minimal brake squeal. My trailer sat just on the outskirts of Collingswood in a small, unkept campground that was free to the public. It should have been a short commute, but the local police had been cutting off a lot of routes lately for seemingly no reason at all. However, these upgrades at the roadblock weren't the usual sheriff's deputies. I knew a few guys at the refinery who were ex-military, and the soldier at the checkpoint had the same polite but deadly mannerisms that told me I was dealing with professionals. Whatever was going on out here, they certainly weren't cleaning up a train derailment, especially since there was no train tracks near this road. Wonder what they need to hide so badly that they hire mercs. Pulling out my phone, I checked my maps app and scanned the spiderweb of small gravel roads around Collingwoods for an alternate route. Some of the roads looked so small that I wondered if they would be out of commission as was the case with many of the neglected coal mining roads in this forgotten part of the Appalachian foothills. Of course, my pickup was four-wheel drive, and if the authorities thought that the road was impassable, then maybe they wouldn't have it guarded. But with dawn only an hour away at best, I'd have to be quick or risk being spotted in the daylight. There. My eyes caught a road called Bethesda Ridge, that ran around a large chunk of land on the map labeled New Wilderness Wildlife Reserve. I had heard a few of the locals in Collingswood talk about that place. How pretty it was in the daylight, full of exotic animals and blooming flowers. I'm not much of a flower guy, but always figured maybe someday I'd take a tour to see what all the fuss was about. There had been something in the news a few days ago about some guy named Richter being involved with a scandal connected to the park, but I never paid attention to it. At any rate, this road looked like it should be well maintained, and would only take me five minutes longer than my usual route. With any luck, I'd be back at my camper squeaky clean and eating hot raviolis in no time. I followed the directions my phone reliably spat out, winding up and down steep inclines through narrow overgrown mining roads, and past farmhouse after dilapidated farmhouse. It depressed me how this area was so run down, the opioid epidemic really throwing the community for a hard loop. Part of me knew just by looking at the faded paint and sagging roof lines that these buildings had been beautiful ones, but poverty, an indifferent government, and the unending flow of narcotics poisoned that beauty, turning it into something like a theme from some 90s analog horror movie. Randy, tell me you're seeing this. Swearing under my breath in surprise, I almost jumped out of my skin and stared at my shortwave walkie-talkie. We use them on the various work sites to communicate between crews, but I didn't recognize this voice. It was a young man, and he sounded scared. Yeah, I see him. An older man's voice came through, low and rough, 
like he was whispering into his mic. Hold fire until they get closer. My curiosity spiked, and I slowed, still driving down the bumpy old coal road in the dark. Most people don't know, but even rudimentary shortwave radios sometimes experience a phenomenon called skip, where the right atmospheric conditions relay radio traffic from somewhere else. Sometimes traffic from different frequencies, channels, or even long distances. I've heard messages as far away as California before, so it didn't surprise me that I could get radio signals like this. Still, they were so clear, so loud, that whoever was talking had to be close by, within 20 miles at least. My God! A woman's voice came through, shocked and tense, as if she were watching a building full of children collapse. There's so many, Randy. What do we... Stay calm. The old man barked back. And I got the feeling he had some background in police or military, with the way he seemed to take command of the situation. Just stay put and conserve your ammo. We'll be fine. Head cocked in confusion, I almost didn't look up in time, and slammed my boot down on the brake pedal. Mud slushed under the knobby tread of my truck tires, and brown fur blurred past my headlights. Stunned, I watched in wide-eyed fascination as no less than fifty white-tailed deer bounded across the decrepit road at full speed, not even paying attention to my rumbling truck. Birds darted overhead, not just owls and crows, but all manner of daytime birds as well. Pigeons, sparrows, songbirds, and even bats. Tens of thousands of bugs seethed over the dirt in the dark sheets of wriggling legs, parting to allow the stampede of possums, raccoons, red foxes, and even a pack of coyotes to flee past them like a tidal wave was hot on their tails. Neither stop to attack each other, prey and predator running together, all with their ears laid back, limbs moving at breakneck speeds without a glance backward. What the? I had never seen animals act like this, not once in all my travels across the U.S. Something seemed to have spooked them, something bad enough that even the insects weren't hanging around to weather the storm. Kaboom! Milliseconds after the old man's voice echoed through the radio, a bright flash lit up the horizon to my left, and a huge fiery orange ball rose from behind the hills bordering the road. My truck rocked, the shockwave rippled through the ground even from this far away, and I ducked out a reflex. What the hell is going on here? My heart roared in my ear, and I pushed the accelerator to the floor, heaving through the horde of wildlife to fly down the dark road like a bat out of hell. Take the next left. The map app on my phone chirped in its neutral, pleasant female voice. And I drifted around the turn without even slowing down, spare sockets from my tool set rolling over the floorboard across my feet. Gravel pinged against the undersides of my truck cab, and the landscape opened up around me, more grasslands than trees. Flickers of orange light filled the sky, and the radio vomited a cacophony of human voices all ranging to be heard about the hiss of static and faint echoes of what sounded like gunfire. On your left! Phillips, watch out! Randy, we need help on the right side. My gun's jammed! I swallowed and dodged potholes as sweat trickled down my scruffy face. Being in the oil field, nothing much scared me after working around some of the scum the companies recruited. But now my pulse thudded against my thin flesh in my temple. My heart rammed into each rib like it wanted out, and the air constricted in my lungs. Above me, The grim clouds reflected seething red and orange flames. The gunshots became audible in spite of my rolled-up window, 
and I caught the rattle of a Kalashinovic rifle, along with the deep boom 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 of a real life M2 machine gun. Take the next left, then proceed straight for two miles. Yanking hard on the steering wheel, I rounded the bend and my jaw dropped. The gravel stretched on a long, back-and-forth, swerving path that was as straight as you could get for the most rural southeastern Ohio back roads. On one side, tall wire mesh fence lined the quiet ditches and grassy meadows, with a sign to my left not ten yards away marked New Wilderness Wildlife Reserve. On the other side, a large open section of grassland stretched out into the distance, potmarked by little tractor paths and clusters of short trees, a few ponds interspersed in between. I could see where, in the daytime, it would have been beautiful, full of multicolored wildflowers and flocks of butterflies. But it wasn't beautiful now. Fire chewed through the tall grass and slow-moving walls of hungry orange and red, sending sparks skyward, and bathed the entire area in shifting shadows. Heavy gray clouds clotted the night sky, and I smelt burning rubber on the wind. Bright yellow muzzle flashes cut through the dark in the mist of the field, and a row of cabins burned on the other side of the plain billowing back smoke rising like a pall of doom. Dug in across the field with their backs to the road, a thin line of people fought with desperate brutality. I saw Armalites and Kalashnikovs intermixed with bolt-action hunting rifles and shotguns, along with flaming bottles of gasoline and pipe bombs covered in taped-on nails. Explosions went off every few seconds the improvised grenades tossed in waves, and one man shouldered what looked to be a homemade rocket launcher made from a fire extinguisher with fins welded onto it. The entire scene looked like the 4th of July on steroids, but the feral desperation of the fight told me this was no rifle range. These people were fighting for their lives, and I felt like I had stumbled into something awful a horrible nightmare that wasn't meant for the outside world to see. And then, as I gripped my steering wheel in dread, through the tall grass, they came. Like lions throwing themselves at the herd of trapped gazelle, hunched figures loped forward, their shadows otherworldly in the light of the flames. Long, slender gray limbs ended in three-fingered claws at each hand, the legs shorter than the distended forearms so that they ran like gorillas. Their muscled shoulders propelled them forward in frightening speed. They didn't have tails, their skin the texture of smooth birch bark, with twig-like extensions poking out from their warty elbows and spines like prehistoric spikes down their backs. Each creature's head was long and narrow, like a crocodile's snout, but with the crown of more branch-like spikes around the skull in a fan, and no eyes that I could discern. This can't be real. In an instant, the screams came through the glass of my truck cab, and cold, bone-chilling shrieks echoed across the wide fields. Not the pained, frightened squeal of an animal defending itself, but an ancient, hate-filled war cry that held no humanity in it whatsoever, repeated by dozens upon dozens of long-limbed predatory fiends. The roar of a diesel cut through the night, and I barely reacted in time to avoid T-boning a massive green combine that burst through an open gate on the left side of the road, its front blades whirling. Someone had wielded sharp angled iron all over it, and gleaming chains that had been bolted to the blades at the front, tipped with shiny bits of razor blades. Black exhaust gusted from its smokestack, and a young man with blonde hair piloted it from the cab, enclosed by a rebar cage into the brushy field. I'll clear the right side. A man called through the radio, sitting in my cup holder. Jamie, you take the left. Let's go wrap him up. Wrap him up. 
Behind the combine came a big yellow backhoe, also covered in spikes and rebar, with long rubber hoses running from the oil drum mounted on the back to a flaming nozzle affixed to its iron bucket. Right behind you! The girl's voice crackled amongst the chatter, and the two machines diverged to swing around on either end of the lane of fighters, their tracks and tires churning up the muddy ground like mechanical dinosaurs. Even from my speeding truck, I heard the impact of the first creatures being mowed down by the combine, its blade and chains ripping into flesh and bone with vicious fury. Opposite it, the backhoe moved its craned arm like the neck of some giant monster and spewed bright yellow flames onto the onrushing horde of pale beans, lighting up the field for hundreds of yards around them. Dozens of mutants fell, either burned or diced to pieces, and the ground shook with the triumphant roar of the diesels. The sickly sweat stench of burnt flesh filled the air, machinery clanged and banged, and the guns roared with chemical delight. Pained creatures from the bizarre creatures echoed, and above the gunfire, a cheer rang out from the line of people. Bill, get out of there! The girl called Jamie cried over the radio. In an instant, the triumphant moment turned the chaos as a creature jumped almost 20 feet into the air and landed like a cat atop the combine. The iron spikes sank deep into the already bleeding feet and hands and ripped into the rebar around the cab with abandon. Metal squealed, bent, and then sheared off as the glass of the cab shattered. A man's scream briefly pierced the radio static, and the combine was overwhelmed, tipped onto its side by a wave of snapping monsters. Fall back! The old man's shout came through the radio, even as I watched a figure that may have been him continue firing the M2 into the onrushing waves of creatures. Fall back to the ridge! Whoa! A white pickup truck lurched into the roadway, and I locked up my brakes to slide around it. A chestnut-haired girl around my age sat at the wheel, blood running down her forehead, with a black polo shirt on. In the bed stood an old man with glasses and gray hair, gripping the handle of a fifty caliber machine gun, its barrel cherry red with heat. Others streamed across the road in full retreat, all in black shirts with the New Wilderness logo on the front, and they all dragged wounded comrades away from the burning field. My truck ground to a stop on the side of a dirt embankment not five feet away, stalling from the sudden downgrade in RPMs. The people in the white truck blinked at me in shock, and I stared right back, both sides seeming confused as to why the other was there. What are you doing? The old man astride the fifty caliber shouted and waved at me as if I was an airplane attempting to land in the wrong airport. Get out of here. Go. Jerked back into the present by his raspy command, I scrambled at the ignition, the stubborn motor choosing this moment to chug, chug, chug instead of fire. Horrid reptilian chittering clicked nearby, and I whimpered like a trapped puppy terror seething through my mind. <sighs> Jamming the stick into reverse, I punched my boot to the gas pedal. The transmission whined, my tires spun, and a sinking feeling ran through my guts. I was high-centered, my wheels caught on either side of the bank, the dirt lodged underneath my truck chases holding me in place. It didn't matter if I had four-wheel drive or not if my wheels couldn't get purchase. I was stuck. Wham! My world lurched sideways as a massive fist had slammed into the cab of my beloved pickup. Gravity inverted, the seatbelt dug into my chest, and broken bits of glass sprayed across my field of vision. Everything seemed to move in slow motion and I watched spare sockets and old candy bar wrappers and my handheld radio float in the air in front of my face. 
Crash. Reality snapped back like a gunshot, and the mutilated Ford rolled down into the ditch of the opposite side of the gravel road. I looked down at the cab ceiling, my arms hanging suspended from my shoulders, and registered a metallic taste in my mouth. Well, that's not good. Somewhere across the road came the dull thud of a heavy footstep, and I turned groggily to see what it was. The creature stood not yards away, tall as a horse, and its crocodilian eyeless head swiveled from side to side, tasting the air. Red blood glistened on its dagger-like yellowed teeth, bared in the firelight, and a long black serpentine tongue flickered in and out rhythmatically. Something about its gray, sinewy form echoed into my head, stirring a part of me I hadn't known existed. I had been scared before as a little kid when my mom would get crazy about her drug habit. I'd been scared on the streets when the older boys tried to sell me to some homeless guy. And I had been scared the day one of the men on our rig down in New Mexico came to work with an axe and killed four people. This was different. This was something else. Something deeper. A primal, extinctual fear, one older than engines, skyscrapers, and radios. A fear born on instinct. The fear of prey when it sees its predator. Jerking its head around, the creature seemed to lock onto me, as if it could smell the terror seeping from my pores and opened its marrow jaws to reveal row after row of jagged, steak-knife-sized teeth. It roared a colossal prehistoric sound that made the skin on my arms crawl with dread. I gotta get out. I thrashed, clawed at my seatbelt buckle my sweaty fingers slipping and sliding over the metal button. Both my lungs felt like they were too small to get enough air, and all the blood rushed to my head in a wave of panic. A shadow fell over me, and I whipped my head around. Foul breath reeked from the torn flesh of a hundred corpses blasted my face, the open maw of the creature right outside my window. Thick gooey strands of saliva threw little rainbow reflections in the light, and the teeth that poked out from the modded gray gums held bits of flesh and clothing stuck between them, a broken shoeless wound around one like a stuck noodle. I could see right down the dark cavern of its throat, and it almost resembled the inside of a rotten log, bumpy and grooved with black flesh instead of rosy pink. I watched as the teeth headed right for my exposed face. Bam, 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 bam. Letting out a howl of pain and anger, the monster staggered back, and dark black spots appeared on its bark-like hide. Smaller silhouettes dashed into the firelight, their guns spitting little streams of flame, while the heavy machine gun thundered on behind them. My mind still spun in horrified confusion, and I hung there motionless as the creature tumbled to the ground in a twitching heap. Hurry up! Grab my hand! Let's go! One of the men in the road dumped several more rifle rounds into the head of the fallen beast. His comrades scuttled towards my truck. A muscular form crouched outside my window, and a man leaned in, about my age with close-cut black hair and bloodied lip. Hey, you still alive? So far. Blood surged in my skull, giving me a headache, and I shouted to be heard above the hammering of the big gun just outside. My belt stuck! A steel knife blade flashed in the dark, and I plummeted to the cab ceiling, barely managing to break my fall with both arms outstretched. Someone grabbed me by the collar and dragged me out into the wet grass. Get up, man. We can't stay here. I got to my feet and scurried with the rest of them for the white pickup truck. Spent brass casings sliding under my boots like marbles. All around me, the creatures devoured anyone they caught up with, and it seemed the guns never stopped firing. 
The night sky filled with smoke from the fires that raged across the open grass fields, and screams of torment from dying people rang in my ears. Driving over the side of my rusty truck bed, I huddled down behind the low wheel well, and the vehicle lurched away from the hill, plowing through a set of reinforced gates at the top. The instant I saw the barbed wire top swing shut behind us, I sat up and the breath stuck in my chest. A crudely built log wall surrounded a cluster of single-story buildings with a large asphalt parking lot in the center. Four towers stood at each corner of the fort, two looking like they had been used for zip lining at one time, and the other two likely built the same time as the wall, made from dented red shipping containers stood on end. From every direction, people carried green ammunition cans, dragged stretchers with wounded on them, or rushed to man the ramparts of the wooden palisades with all kinds of weapons in their arms. Many were young, likely no older than their early twenties at best, their faces sheet white with fear. What the hell is this place? Darren, grab some gloves and help Richard get this gun on that wall. Barking at the top of his gravely smoker's voice, the old man waded through the sea of hot brass casings in the truck bed and leaned down to offer me a hand up. On your feet, son. No time to waste. I... what are... what's going on? Phyllis, grab some ammo and top everyone off. Oblivious to my sputtered protests, the old man jumped down from the truck bed and continued pointing people to their stations. David, get on the radio and tell the martyr crews to start laying hate. Sean, find this guy a gun and check on Carter's men. The dark-haired guy who had pulled me from my Ford jumped down from the truck and gestured for me to follow him. Come on, this way. Confused and terrified, I ran after him, dodging five girls in blood-stained clothing who ran to carry a wounded man back into a long rectangular building to our left, with a sign marked New Wilderness Visitor Center beside the doorway. We ducked through the door, then down a narrow hallway to the left, and the man named Sean pushed open the door to what looked to be a storeroom. Green ammo cans were stacked to the ceiling, with black plastic crates on the side marked medical, and a mostly empty weapons rack bolted to the brick wall. Various bits of vests, holsters, and tactical gear hung from the hooks beside the ammunition, and a row of black gas masks dangled next to them. Did a doomsday bunker explode in here? You know how to shoot? He tossed a woodland camo-patterned bandolier at me. The pouch is already filled with gray steel magazines, and yanked one of the few remaining rifles from the weapons rack. Wide-eyed with stock, I blinked down at the web gear in my hand. I mean, yeah, but what's going on? Sean pushed the gleaming black rifle into my arms, and held my gaze with wild bloodshot eyes. I don't have time to explain, all right? If you want to live, follow me and do exactly as I say, got it? Woof, woof. Outside, the dull roar of something like a propane cannon split the air, and Sean grabbed a few more ammunition cans before he slipped past me out the door. Come on, the martyrs are up. We've got to reinforce the left flank or the freaks will be inside the wire. Put your stuff on, man. Let's go. Running while pulling a poorly adjusted chest rig on provoked to be nearly impossible. So I slung the morass of nylon over one shoulder, gripping my rifle as we sprinted through the courtyard. We passed two circular sandbag pits, manned by a couple scrawny teenagers who feverishly dropped homemade rockets into a couple of green painted steel pipes, dirt flying with every shot. Eerie roars echoed just on the other side of the wall, returned by the fighters atop the ramparts pouring in lead at the beasts without pause. The crack of rifles blending into the never-ending wave, 
The stench of coppery blood and acrid gunpowder filled the air, along with pillars of black smoke from burning fuel bombs. Medics staggered around the yard, some of them girls who looked no older than sixteen, pressing white gauze to spurting wounds, and leaning over their wounded patients to shield them from dust kicked up from the martyrs. It was absolute bedlam, and all I wanted to do was find something solid to crawl under. Carter! Sean charged up a set of steps and into a log pillbox built atop the leftmost corner of the wall. Ammo! Inside, a few older men with silver in their hair and beer guts beneath their weather-worn army fatigue snatched up the ammunition cans from Sean. Empty magazines covering the floor around them. Despite their bulky physiques, I got the impression from how they moved that these men had worn those uniforms before, in a different time, when they had darker hair and slimmer waistlines. Looks like a VFW meeting on cocaine. One of the men, a thinner guy with a short gray ponytail and Viking-style beard, crouch walked over to us. Where's the 50? He shouted. The incessant bam-bam of guns enough to make my ears hurt. Randy said it to the front gate. Sean howled back and jerked his thumb at himself and I. Where are your reinforcements? The gray-haired man pointed to his right, through the firing slit of the little fighting position. Dawn's not far off. We just gotta hold him off until then. Pick a spot and get to work. Sean scuttled to an open spot at the firing line, racking the charging handle of my rifle with clammy fingertips. I flicked the safety switch off and peered down the dimly lit iron sights into the darkness. Dear God. There had to be close to 200 of them, surging over the burning field past the fallen combine and up the slope to the walls in fluid, deadly speed. Like ocean waves, they rolled forward, dozens upon dozens, a never-ending tide of long-limbed, reptile-faced monsters, with wood skin that seemed to eat bullets. Without fear, they threw themselves at the wall, oblivious to the danger, almost immune to the pain. Driven by an insatiable urge to rip and tear, their ancient battle roars enough to chill me to the bone. I blinked and caught sight of one as it crawled up an incline of its dead fellows, reptilian teeth bared, moving so fast it was almost a blur. Placing the front sight post over its bark-like hide, I pressed the trigger over and over. The rifle buckled in my arms obediently. Gunfire from our position peppered the oncoming monster and it fell with an agonizing shriek less than 30 yards away, black blood oozing from dozens of wounds. In my hands, the smoking rifle yawned with an empty chamber, and I ducked down to reach for a fresh magazine. Just before I could reload, however, something in the distance caught my eye. Pinpricks of light flickered in the far tree line, yellow sporadic flashes that looked vaguely familiar. It occurred to me that the beasts outside weren't fleeing from the gunfire, even as we mowed them down, almost as if they had nowhere else to go but run through the hail of lead. By all accounts, they should have turned tail and ran for the woods like any other animal. But why weren't they? Squinting hard, I focused on the lights, and something inside my brain clicked. Muzzle flashes. They were concealed just inside the cover of the dark pines, as many as 60 more guns firing into the herd of crawling nightmares. But they weren't moving in to help clear the beasts from the fort walls. Instead, they stayed where they were, turning any stray monsters that tried to escape away and sent them lumbering towards our position. They're hurting them. They're hurting them right to us. The tree line! I snapped Sean's arm until he stopped firing and pointed to the distant gunfire. 
See that? There's guys over there. Sean yanked a black handheld radio from his chest rig and clicked the talk button. Marksman, hit the trees. I repeat, muzzles flashes in the tree line. Hit them hard. I pressed the trigger several times in the general direction of the flashes, emptying mag after mag in an effort to keep both the monsters and the mysterious human instigators at bay. Others on the ramparts with scoped hunting rifles seemed to be having better luck, as cries of, Got one! and I hit him! echoed from every position. One by one, the flashes started to fade out, either due to retreat or the marksmen finding their target. A soft warmth tickled my left cheek, and I turned to see the sky begin to lighten, the first long ray of sunshine slipping over the dark horizon. Dawn. Cheers went up from all down the line. With the unknown attackers in the tree line suppressed, some of the monstrous creatures turned from the tide of lead and made their way for the forest. Their flight started a rout, as more creatures followed like a flock of birds, and soon, the last of them disappeared into the trees at the far side of the scorched grassland. The gunfire started to slacken off, and I slumped down with my back to the wall beside Sean, the two of us grinning with relief. Not bad, newbie. He leaned his steaming rifle against the wall to cool off and stuck out a hand. Sean Hammond. Ethan. I shook it, heart still racing, and set my own rifle on the floor, waves of heat rising from its now purple barrel. Ethan Sanderson. He pulled out a small flask and unscrewed the cap to offer it to me. Well, Sanderson, cheers. You didn't die. Glad to know that's a celebratory accomplishment out here. With my limbs shaking from the adrenaline wearing off, I cast back my head to gulp down some of the burning amber whiskey. What were those things? Sean climbed to his feet and gave me a hand up. Birch crawlers. They usually don't cluster into super packs that big unless they're hunting or threatened. I figure we have Sheriff Warnoff to thank for that. My eyes widened, and I stared out into the gutted battlefield, trying to count the bodies and failing miserably. Warnoff? Our Warnoff? I don't get it, man. Why would the cops do something like this? That's exactly what I asked the sheriff. Sean's face hardened into a firm frown right before he tried to blow my brains out. They've been lying to us, all of us, for years. My blood ran cold at the way he said that, but I refused to lose my cool. So, what do we do now? Picking up his rifle, Sean slung it over one shoulder and scratched at his stubble beard with a yawn. Well, I'd say it's about breakfast time, wouldn't you? Might as well get comfortable, Sanderson. Looks like you're going to be here for a while, since Warnov and his men are still out there. Too relieved to be alive, and confused by the deluge of strange events that I witnessed, I shuffled out of the pillbox into the early morning breeze. Groans from wounded and dying fighters rose through the air many of the nurses weeping and wailing as more of the critically injured began to die from blood loss. Most of the gunfire ceased, only a few of the fighters still finishing off wounded birch crawlers with merciless hate. In the creeping daylight, a carpet of dead monsters laid piled up against the palisade wall, some so high I could have reached over and touched their still twitching claws. They had gotten close, too close, and I realized that my death had clambered within a few feet from me more than once this night. How these things even existed, I still don't know. It made no sense to me. None of it. Hey, new guy. I looked down to see a chestnut-haired girl waving from beside a metal oil drum, a fire burning in the center of it. Suit and exhaustion lined her face, but it still bore a soft, friendly smile. 
you frozen up there? Over. It was over. At least for now. And that was all that mattered. I survived my childhood. I survived the streets of Pittsburgh. If I could do that, I figured, then this strange park was no different. Just like before, I would take it one day at a time. I'd get some food, scrounge more ammunition, and see if I could find some decent cell phone service. Maybe the girl by the fire would lend me her phone. It'd be a good excuse to get her number. You know, it's kind of pretty here in the daytime. Taking a deep breath of crisp morning air, I shouldered my rifle and made my way down the wooden rampart steps. The smell of wood smoke in my nose and the echoes of guns still ringing in my ears. Today's video was supported by patrons like Mark from Earth, Crimson Muse, Joy Burton, Diane Showers, Mark Sewall, Cheryl James, Pick Your Sticker, Teddy Dog, Clue 404, Mamakado, Dante Kincaid, Zarin Ray, Angela Donovan, Blair Ann 50, Devin Kyle, Timothy Baird, Ajeti, Burt Turner, Bajani Espinal, Michael Pierce, and Big Joe. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider joining my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Jordan Group Horror. As a patron, you'll get access to bonus videos and content. You'll be credited at the end of every video going forward. And if you decide to stay for three months, I'll name a character after you, which will be featured in the next Hollow's End story. Links to join are in the description. Thanks everyone for listening. Please like, subscribe, and comment to help the channel continue to grow. And see you again next time at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hope you have a great night.